Hey, good morning, friends. I'm so glad you decided to join me to get your day started with a biblical perspective. We have a lot of ground to cover in this episode, so I hope you have some caffeine and let's just jump in. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 4, and we open with the battle of the Philistines against the Israelites. And I'm not sure how you feel about the Philistines, but I feel like they're in every story. They're like always the bad guys in the Old Testament. And I feel like I heard about them all the time in Sunday school and VeggieTales. So I wanted to do a little background of the Philistines because I feel like there has to be more to them than just being the bad guy, right? So the origin of the Philistines has not yet been fully clarified. The majority of the researchers consider them to be among the Sea Peoples. Thus, they could have come from the Aegean Islands or the Greek mainland. Their main god was called Dagon, and we see him throughout scripture. He was half man and half fish, which now makes sense to me because if they were from the islands... They were by water because I feel like most of the Old Testament takes place in a desert. Does it not? Probably not, but I feel like it does. Okay. And Dagon was worshipped mainly through animal sacrifice, festivals, and celebration in his name. There's historical evidence of this. And the Philistines had other like mini gods, if you will. Dagon was the main one. But we also hear about Baal, who was the god of fertility or reproduction, as well as the god of rainstorms. I did look him up and he is like a skinny gnome and he kind of looks like an alien to me. It's very interesting. You could Google him. Also, Dagon is like a merman, basically. He's like half fish, half man. So interesting. And for the quick uh, research I did do, you could probably spend a lot of time on ancient gods, but we're also going to talk about the two goddesses. I don't know how to say these names. One is Astari and the other is Ashir. No idea if that's right. You could Google it. Some say all the manifestations of these two ladies were really the same goddess. Basically, it was the same person worshipped, or I guess being, worshipped in different regions. So same goddess, just in different parts of the area was a different name. Other people say that they actually were two distinct goddesses. So kind of some argument here. These goddesses were portrayed as the companions to whatever god was worshipped in that region. So there's also evidence suggesting that these goddesses were sometimes paired with God, Yahweh, our God, in the false teachings that were mixed with idol worship in God's law. There's also times when they're portrayed as the wife or companion of Baal and the companion of Dagon etc, etc. So there's these little goddesses who I guess every man needs a woman, right? I suppose. So anyways, some of the false teaching back then was the women being paired with the God, Yahweh, our God. So interesting. And I'm sure there's more, you know, about this and we'll go into, but just wanted to give you some background on the Philistines, who they were, where they came from, etc. Now, the biblical Philistines are no longer in existence today. After their land was conquered by the Neo-Babylonians, they assimilated into the culture of their conquerors and became extinct over time. There is some argument made that they settled in modern day Palestine, as the whole area later, if you look back through the history, was called Palestine by the Greeks. So some people say that that's where they assimilated, but no evidence for that now. Okay, so now that we visited the Philistines, we're going to go back to this story a little bit. The Israelites went out to fight the Philistines. We find this in 1 Samuel 4, where we're going to begin. And in the first battle, the Israelites lost 4,000 men. So they were like, we're losing. What are we going to do? They decided... We have the Ark of the Covenant. God is literally in there. Let's bring it out to the battlefield and see what happens. He's surely going to protect us. So the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the tabernacle per God's instructions in the Holy of Holies. Arguments have been made. It had been in the Holy of Holies at this point for about 400 years. And we know from rewinding back to the beginning of the series, there were very specific instructions. You couldn't touch the Ark of the Covenant. You had to hold it by the poles. You had to put... When there was a sacrifice, blood on it in a certain way, it was very, very, God gave very specific instructions. This was a very holy object, and it was in the tabernacle for 400 years at this point. Many biblical scholars state the issue here is that the Israelites had this passive attitude towards the Ark of the Covenant. The very relic that held God's presence was now being viewed as a good luck charm for battle. 
And here we have our two little guys, Eli's sons, who we learned about in the previous episode. If you didn't listen to that one from the beginning of this week, you can hear more about them. But they were called not God of men. (laughs) And of course, they were caught right in the middle of the shenanigans of getting the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield. Basically, the Israelites are like, we need help. Let's get the Ark of the Covenant. It will protect us. A takeaway from this part of the story is don't get caught up in the paraphernalia that modern believers sometimes rely on in the place of God, including like a crucifix, a picture of Jesus, or a family Bible positions conspicuously in the home but seldom read, the hope of spiritual success by regular church attendance, or even daily readings of the Bible, or certain prayers or certain things you have to do. These things, as good as they may be, are no substitute for the vital personal relationship with God. These things don't give us a relationship with God. These actions are just sometimes robotic actions that we're doing because we feel like we need to. You actually need a true relationship with God. These relics or these rituals do not replace your relationship, a personal relationship with God. Your salvation is not in those. It's in Jesus. And getting back to the story, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant to the camp, it says all of Israel raised such a great shout that the ground actually shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting going on in the Hebrew camp? So the Philistines just defeated them. They killed 4,000 of their men. And then all of a sudden there's this like huge shout and celebration. Like what's going on? When the Philistines learned the Ark of the Covenant had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. They said, a God has come into the camp. We're doomed. They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Very interesting. They referenced back, you know, Moses, let my people go. I'm sure we all saw the movie and the plagues that God inflicted upon the Egyptians. So definitely God's power was around and they knew that this God of the Israelites or gods, as they say, was very powerful. So they were afraid, but they kind of like vamped themselves up like, we can do this, we can do this. And then it says, so the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of the Covenant was captured and the two sons of Eli died. And then as we learned in the last episode, his daughter-in-law dies in childbirth as well. But before she passes away, she names her son Ichibod, which means without glory. In scripture, it says, as the glory had departed from Israel because of the capture of the Ark of the Covenant. The translation of the word depart in the Old Testament means to go into exile. So the idea here is... The exile is a constant threat of the nation for domesticating God. Basically, they domesticated God, and now they're the ones that are going to be going into exile without the Lord. So what did the Philistines do with the Ark of the Covenant? They're like, oh, we got their God. What are we going to do with it? Well, in this time, bringing idols and statues of the enemies that you defeated were basically like trophies and like a conquest to show that your God was superior to theirs. They won. You have their God, blah, blah, blah. So they put the Ark of the Covenant in Dagon's temple right next to their God, Dagon, who is a statue. And they all went to bed probably really happy. Well, when they rose the next day, Dagon, their God, had fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant. And they were a little freaked, so they took Dagon and put him back in his place. Well, falling on one's face was a posture associated with true worship. So the way that Dagon was positioned, it showed that he was almost inferior. He's giving worship to the Ark of the Covenant. And this is also paralleled later with David and Goliath. When Goliath falls, he actually falls on his face before David, almost like a worship, but not just for David to the Lord as the Lord's champion. So interesting. Okay. So they're like, oh no, Dagon fell. He's worshiping the Ark of the Covenant. Ah, so let's put him back up. So they put him back up. But then the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant and his head and his hands had been broken off and they were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained and they still don't use the threshold to this day. So what's a threshold? The threshold here is probably referring to like the pedestal on which the idol sat or the entryway to its chamber. Either way, this fact implies several things. 
first they were a little freaked out, of course. Then the severed head and hands meant this was no natural or common accident. It's not like the idol fell down and like, you know, broke into a million pieces. It was very intentional. Also, cutting off the heads and hands of enemy soldiers was one of the brutal methods during this era for demonstrating a complete dominance over other nations. So this confirmed the Ark of the Covenant was not just an idol. The Ark was not God's, was not the God of Israel. The Ark was a symbol of God's presence among his people. Of course, it played an important role in, in Israel's worship, but the box itself was not being worshipped, was not an idol. God, God was God. <laughs> and in contrast, Dagon was a, an, simply an idol fashioned to be their God who had no power. So this must have raised an important question for the Philistines. Did Dagon really defeat Yahweh in the battle? Clearly not. The idea that Yahweh had somehow cut off Dagon's head and hands was clearly meant to humiliate the Philistines and their God. So this display of God's power does not end here. Scripture says the Lord's hand was heavy on the people and its vicinity. He brought devastation upon them and afflicted them with tumors. There's also other passages that said rats appeared in the land and there was death and destruction throughout the city. So, of course, the people are like, mm, this isn't really a good situation. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, send the ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go to its own place or it will kill us and our people. They're like, get this out of here. This is not good. They said, for death has filled the city with panic and God's hand is very heavy on it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. The Philistines repeatedly were forced to acknowledge the Lord's superior power over themselves and their God, Dagon. This is another testimony to the Lord's sovereignty in this narrative. And the question is, how did the Ark of the Covenant get back to Israel? Well, friends, that's a little cliffhanger I'll leave you with for the weekend. But for now, let's get a little practical. We speak today or use the phrase today of don't put God in a box or you put God in a box, don't put God in the box, whatever. But looking at the Israelites, they really did imagine that God was in a box. I ne never thought about this before. They were like, but God is like right over there in that box. And even furthermore, they could carry him wherever they wanted to, to get whatever they needed at that time. So basically his presence, they were like, oh, we're going to bring God's presence here and there. Very interesting thought. But using religious relics and paraphernalia in attempts to motivate God to cooperate with us or our endeavors is not good. We believe their use makes God more disposed to us. God is offended by such attempts. What is in your best interest always lies with God and not you. My friend Brooke and I were talking about this story and one of our questions was like, why would God allow, how did God allow himself to be captured? Like, I don't understand. Why would God allow himself to be stolen? God is powerful. He definitely could have defeated the Philistines. And after researching this more, I feel like I maybe kind of came to a little bit of a conclusion. Obviously, we're never going to know why God did something until we can ask him ourselves. But it would seem that God allowed the removal of himself from his people in a response to the crime of domesticating God, basically presuming that he could do whatever he wanted, employing him as a kind of charm or a power at the beck at your beck and call. So basically, even though God was in a box at this time, he was still God and he wasn't really in the box, you know, and basically him being removed from the Israelites was a punishment to them. God could defend himself with anyone he was with. So, you know, like part of me is like, oh my gosh, God was captured. Okay, well, God's going to be okay. <laughs> and basically this was a punishment of departing himself from the Israelites. And then obviously the Philistines got a punishment as well. And this was in response to the crime of domesticating him and using him as however they might want the wind to blow. And in this story, both the Israelites and the Philistines tend to take the ark 
of the covenant too lightly. They have no appreciation for the holiness of God and these sacred objects. Both tend to look at the ark as more of an idol rather than God himself. Both seek to control God rather than trust in him and obey his commandments. The bottom line, ladies, God cannot be manipulated. And furthermore, God will not tolerate attempts of manipulation. In the end, you cannot control or resist his will. We must follow him rather than expecting him to follow us. I know in 2024, people aren't sitting around with Dagon idols on their fireplace, half merman, you know, falling and worshiping them that I know of. But as we really sit and reflect, idols are very much a part of our lives. We worship them through TV, music, movies, social media, and etc. And I would even argue that pagan worship is slowly seeping back into our ways of society. But that's definitely a topic for a different episode, but it's coming just so you know. The consistent testimony of scripture is of a God who demands exclusive devotion. This God will not tolerate mini me's or clones or AI generated relics, which I think is a whole nother thing that we can talk about another time. The world definitely encourages us to follow and give our time to and devote ourselves to their gods. Rejecting the evidence of the one true God in nature and conscience and science and history and revelation and otherwise. Just like the ancient Philistines, the modern pagans manufacture an alternate reality to justify their polytheism, shaping culture based on their own presuppositions of reality. And while yes, we aren't in the temple bowing down to stone statues, I think we contribute to idol worship more than we we might realize. Just something to ponder as we latte our way into the weekend. And a few points to reflect on today. Have you been using or approaching God as a lucky charm rather than approaching him in reverence and submitting to his power? Have you been pursuing the Lord in your daily life or have you been leading and expecting God to follow? Are you allowing modern idol worship to take place in your life? Well, thanks for listening, friends, and sticking with me through this episode. It was super last minute. I really went down to crunch time, so I hope you enjoyed it, and it all kind of was cohesive. I hope you all have fabulous Fridays. Also, be on the lookout for some new content. I'm really trying to come up with some interesting little tidbits for you guys, and also um, doing another Meet My Friends series. Actually, I have three coming up very shortly, so looking forward to doing those with you ladies. And I hope you all have great weekends, and I'll talk to you soon.